gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Ed uh, Sedesso. Some of you, of course, will know him, uh, who, who trained in Oxford, but also in Munster and in the Cleveland Clinic in the States, and brought back some really exciting, cutting-edge technologies for us to use in Oxford. Uh, he works both in Oxford, but also provides an outreach service to patients in Berkshire uh, in the Reading area, uh, and, and is really our expert on the complex endovascular keyhole surgery. Uh, thank you, Ed. Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, Ashok, for giving me the opportunity just to um, talk through some of the more the, the great advances that really have happened in vascular surgery over um, the past few years. Now, I would hope that um, by the end of the talk, you will get a flavour of some of the options that are open to us to treat what is um, essentially quite a complex problem. A little bit of anatomy. Now, um, uh, you're all well aware, you hear these words brandished around the aorta, the infrarenal aorta, and abdominal aortic aneurysms. And the point really is just to identify where the problem is. That is your heart. This is obviously a schematic diagram, which is the main pump in the body. Now, the red markers indicate the arteries in the body. And this artery coming out here of the heart is the aorta. So it's a direct communication with the heart. And the heart, to all intents and purposes, is a modified blood vessel. So that blood vessel carries its way all the way down through your chest into your abdominal cavity, your tummy, down below the kidneys, which are sat here. And the same artery splits into two to go and supply your legs. So it's a very important vessel. And the aorta itself ends at this point where it becomes your iliac arteries. If we take things one step further, so the heart would normally sit in this area. In the normal person, you have the aorta coming up. It gives a blood supply to your arms and your head and neck, and then comes all the way down in your chest cavity. And then your diaphragm sits here, comes into the tummy cavity, gives off some very important branches that supply your gut, your liver, your spleen, and then continues down in the leg. Now, the normal size of the aorta, we sort of touched on it. It's normally below three centimeters in diameter. Above that, we say it's abnormally dilated, which is what an aneurysm is. Now, an aneurysm itself can occur at any point along this artery. And indeed, we do see them starting right down there next to the heart and can carry on all the way down involved in all these important vessels as well. And therefore, that gives you a different idea of the complexity of the disease that we deal with. Endovascular aneurysm repair, or EVAR, or keyhole surgery, um, which you get lots of names um, you know, saying the same thing. But essentially, it's a minimally invasive way of trying to deal with this problem. Traditionally, we would have made a big open cut in the tummy for the infrarenal aneurysm and try and put clamps on the artery, as Sabina has just demonstrated, that gives a major stress on the heart and it's a big operation. We put clamps at the top, we clamp off the arteries to your legs and we hand sew in a graft to try and do the job of the native aorta. It's a very durable repair and has stood the test of time actually and we know that if you do come through the operation actually you have an excellent survival and long-term durability from that procedure, going out to 20, 25 years. This is a good thing, but you do have a mortality associated with the operation. And it's an operation that is not open to all. If your heart isn't um, strong enough to actually tolerate the procedure, you may be turned down for repair. And that really pushed this gentleman called Juan Parodi there's a chap in Argentina who was a vascular surgeon to try and think of a better way or a different <coughs> way to try and deal with this same problem. And he thought, well, why don't we try and tackle this same problem rather than coming at it from the outside of the artery, we can actually gain access on the inside of the artery and place a tube device on the inside of the artery and exclude that aneurysmal segment. And he felt that that would give less trauma to the patient, 
You do not require a big open cut in your tummy. You do not require the cross clamping of the aorta. And actually, possibly, patients will have a lower operative mortality and faster recovery. And perhaps it will be a better treatment for those patients who are less fit. His first procedure was done in 1991. He was thinking about this procedure pretty much in the 1980s. So that just gives you an idea as to how research moves in the medical world. It just takes a lot of time, but you need people who are innovative and think slightly differently to the mass. This is Quan Parodi. This was his first stent graft. As you can see, it's a rather crude device. And um, this was pretty much made in the back bench of an operating theatre. And he managed to put this into a bit of tubing that he collapsed it right down, pushed it into the patient's aorta as a single tube and sealed an aneurysm. Now, the patient he performed this procedure on was actually a friend of the Prime Minister of Argentina who was on home oxygen and had been turned down for repair of his aneurysm. And Perodi did this procedure and the gentleman survived. From that day on, I think the endovascular revolution took hold in vascular surgery. There were early pioneers of this procedure and in fact one of the first endovascular procedure was actually done here in Oxford by um, one of my old tutors, Jack Collin. Um, he didn't like the procedure so much because we had several complications at that stage. Like I said to you, the devices that were being put in were rather crude, the techniques were not refined and therefore there were problems with them. And that led to this big trial, which was the EVAR1 trial which was essentially going to look at endovascular repair versus open repair in patients with abdominal um, aortic aneurysms. This was done in about in 2000 and I think finished in about 2005. They enrolled over a thousand patients here in the UK and split them into two groups. One group have an open repair, the other group have an um, endovascular repair. And what this showed was that at the 30 day period, the mortality from endovascular repair was significantly lower than open repair. In fact, was at 1.4%, as opposed to open repair, which ran at about 4.5% nationally. Now, you've got to remember these figures were coming from excellent centres that did a lot of open repair and had low mortality. At that time, the mortality from open aneurysm repair in the UK was close to 8 to 10%, which was pretty high. One thing that it did show that was after you put these stents into people, there was a reasonable chance that you'll have to go back in to try and deal with problems that may have arisen from that. So it wasn't as durable as an open repair, but you had to survive the open repair in the first place. We now have new generation stent grass. Now these are, the industry have led the way really, and there are lots of companies who now produce stent grafts, different configuration, they're pretty much doing the same thing. This is an example of a, of a Bolton Triavound stent graft, which is one of the newer stent grafts we use these days. As you can see, the material and fabric that this is made for is similar to the fabric that we normally stitch in when we do operations. Um, uh, and they've got barbs on them, there's little springs which give good radial force to ensure that you've got good wall apposition. These barbs will stop the stents from migrating downwards. These are all refinements that have come in um, since the initial stent grafts. And uh, you know, the joins between the limbs have also been modified as well as the bottom ends of them. The other things that are important that we saw like come to know now more and more these days is that the, the delivery systems that we push, we, we, we deliver these stent grafts through have reduced in size markedly because your access arteries that we have to gain access through are not particularly big arteries. This is a disease of people in advancing age. They normally have disease within them and they can cause problems when you try and deliver these stents in. So lower profile devices are now out in the market and it means that it just, it just gives us the opportunity to treat more and more people with this technique. There are limitations, however, and therefore open surgical repair is still an excellent option. The shape of the aneurysm, and that, that's what I mean by morphology, is important. 
where the renal arteries, where all those important arteries in the, in the upper segment of the abdominal aorta are, are also important because it may mean that you can't put a straightforward stent graft into patients. I've talked about access vessel issues and there is this concept of what we call endo leak. Now an endo leak is when you've put the stent graft into position and you get leakage of blood around the stent graft because what that means is that you're still pressurizing this aorta which is weakened and it still has a potential to rupture and grow in size. So we've got to ensure that actually our stent graft is well placed to seal all around these edges, both at the bottom and the top, to stop this sac from actually being pressurised and getting bigger. And that means that after the procedure we take lots of x-rays and make sure that hasn't happened. In the long term you will need to be followed up lifelong to ensure that the stents haven't moved and the sac isn't growing. There are a variety of endo lead types which have been described in the literature. I wouldn't bore you with it, but essentially the whole point of them is to pre prevent the sac from being pressurised and um, ultimately resulting in rupture of the aneurysm. There's a video here which will just describe the process. It is an animation, and I hope it works. Oh, doesn't bring it. That's why I wanted to use my laptop. Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> Um, essentially, access to these arteries comes through the groin. We make tiny cuts about that size, size of a thumbprint in order to treat your aneurysm and hence the word keyhole surgery has come into play. We can do this without making, sometimes we do have to make bigger cuts in, but, and, and this is called a percutaneous access procedure. Your hospital stay is essentially a 24 hour stay. Sometimes we keep you in for two days. And most patients are up and about in the evening of their operation. So fish and chips is not off the menu. <laughs> you certainly have a quicker recovery. So when you go home, we know that you, you still had a big operation, but you know, you, you'll be back doing most things and most activities daily living within a week or two. And as um, Sabina, rightly said, we can do these procedures under local anaesthesia or regional anaesthesia so you're awake when we do them. And most people actually tolerate them quite well. I'll just get a little word about, you know, where things are now moving on to. Now, we talk about complex endovascular procedures. I did mention about these important vessels supplying things like your kidneys, your gut and your liver. And the aneurys aneurysmal disease does not just decide it's going to stop at the renal arteries. It can involve any of these things. And so we've had to develop ways in order to tackle that. And one of these ways is to put bridging stents from um, stent grafts that are made and individualised to the patient. So they take about six weeks to make from your CT scan that we send them off to places like Australia. They get made specifically for you. And they come back to us and we then have to um, fit these stent grafts into you and target these vessels by bridging them with stents. There are other ones that have brown tubes within them and you can do the same thing and it, you, it gives an actually excellent and durable result. Now most of these patients would have had to have major open surgery with mortality probably in excess of what I told you earlier on in order to deal with these segments. Now we can deal with them with these stent grafts and they're normally in hospital for three days. In an emergency situation whereby we don't have the luxury of six weeks to get these stent grafts. There are other techniques we can try, and this is something called the chimney <coughs> technique, just by virtue that you've got stents going upwards, and we try and make them with stents around kidney arteries and visceral arteries, and that works quite well. Where are we now with um, further technology with infrarenal aneurysms? If you look here, this is something called an endovascular aneurysm sealing technique. Most of the graphs that I showed you before, we were railroading stents on the inside of the artery and then trying to build things from the outside and trying to get good wall apposition with the stents sitting um, against the aneurysm wall. With this technique, we put two tubes essentially into the artery and they've got bags surrounding them and we fill the bags with a specific <coughs> polymer that ends up being slightly like putty. And that means we can really treat aneurysms that have a short proximal ends and um, because these bags literally sit and fill the sac themselves and you seal off the aneurysm by doing that. 
This is a newer technique, which again we're doing now in Oxford, and we've done several cases of that with excellent results. Other things that we've done are cases such as this, which is a particularly complex case, whereby we've had to put a stent graft in and then railroad major stents into arteries going to the liver, arteries supplying your gut, your two kidney arteries down here. And again, this gentleman had a great result, having had a ruptured aneurysm come into us from as far as field as Cheltenham, and I was able to fix this gentleman, and he was off home in five days. So in summary, I mean, this is a quick fire thing. I'm just over my 15 minutes, so I'll try and stop here. What I hope I've demonstrated to you is that EVA has really changed the landscape of treatment with, with that for aneurysms. It's opened a new world to patients who I think previously may have been turned down for surgery. We now offer them this treatment. What it's also done, actually, is opened up this treatment to those who are fit for open surgery as well. Because some people, there's, there's an equipoise and there's a balance between which is a better treatment. And some patients may prevent this, prefer this sort of treatment, but it does require long, long li um, lifelong surveillance. Research is important in this place. I started off with telling you about Quan Parade. If it wasn't for someone actually who went away and thought about that research aspect to come, come up with innovations like this, we would not be where we are. So we have to have ongoing research, not only to make sure that we're continually improving um, these techniques, but also to see if we can come up with something better. Because at some stage, someone would think this is a pretty crude thing to do. Thank you.